This beautiful composite, We Will Miss You, was awarded a platinum at the 8th Annual International Imaging Competition and was also a judge's choice. It received a first place in the 7th International Imaging Challenge and was part of the BPA or Professional Photographers of America's Loan Collection in 2019. Let us speak with the artist Judy Reinfurth who created this image. Welcome to Award Winning Images Explained. My name is Manpreet and I'm your host. Judy Reinfurth owns and operates a boutique style studio in Pennsylvania doing portraits of horses, dogs, families, and fairy tales. Graduating from Kutztown University with a BFA in Communication Design and Fine Art Photography, she today is an award-winning image maker and according to printcompetition.com, has the highest average score of any photographer in the last 12 months. Her style is unmistakable and her images are not one that a viewer can just glance over. It's no wonder she's a much sought after speaker and educator. Her seminars have gained a lot of national attention. Traveling to PPA affiliates and photography guilds across the country. Even small events have attendees flying in from far away. I have personally attended her class and know that today you are in for a treat. I'm truly humbled and honored to chat with her today and bring to you a glimpse of her thought process behind one of her amazing images. So welcome, Judy. Hello, how are you? Excellent, how about you? Pretty good. <laughs> so, um, I understand that you are on the East Coast and it's got pretty warm there now, huh? Yes, we've had some very unseasonable temperatures the last couple of days. It was more like July than April. <laughs> oh, no. very, very nice to that get out. you have to enjoy. Yeah, for sure. So, now before we get into the image, Judy, Tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Judy? And how did you transition? How did you get into digital painting and making such amazing images? So my journey with digital painting started um, when I de decided to enter print competitions, first for PPA and then later on for other competitions. But I, I saw a lot of people were painting their images and at first I didn't understand, um, you know, it's a photography competition. Why are we painting our images? But it seemed to be the, the new, the new norm, um, the new rage. Um, and I remember I said to my husband, um, I want to enter these competitions, but I need to learn how to digitally paint. And he said to me, well, how is that going to make you more money? And I said, I don't know yet, but I'll figure it out. And so I actually first learned how to paint from Richard Sturdot. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the early stages of painting, people were using uh, Corel Painter. And I just didn't really like that program. And I kept trying to figure out how, how to make it work. And I felt like the learning curve was really uh, difficult. And then... Richard showed a technique in Photoshop before Photoshop painting was really a thing. And I was like, oh, okay, so you can kind of make this work in Photoshop. And then as each year went by, I mean, this is going back to CS6. Um, as each year went by, Photoshop got better and better at um, allowing you to create painted effects um, in Photoshop itself. I've just recently started tinkering around with Rebel. Um, which is another painting program. And I walked away from Corel um, once I felt comfortable because I've been in Photoshop since uh, 1993. Um, wow. Version one. Um, so, you know, when you learn a program from the beginning and it doesn't have a lot of, a lot of options yet and they add on a couple options and a couple more options and a couple more options, you're kind of growing with the program. 
But when mm-hmm. you start with a program that's so advanced um, from the, you know, you're brand new to a very advanced program, it's much harder to learn. So I kind of felt that way with Corel. Um, so I started painting for competition and um, also decided to, for my birthday when I turned 50, which was almost seven years ago, I decided to go to the zoo and uh, do something with my girlfriends that was more like what you would do on your birthday when you're a kid. And I started painting the zoo animals and started getting interested in what were zoos all about and conservation and how they're preserving some of the species and raising money and things like that. So it kind of took me down a, a, a path I didn't expect as far as getting involved with raising money for different zoos and things like that. Uh-huh. And and were you a, a photographer uh, before that? Or what was your background? I was in the dark room with my grandpa when I was six years old. And I got my first camera when I was 13. Um, it was a Minolta. Then during high school, I continued to take photos and um, mostly I took photos of just about anything that interested me back then. Um, I did do some landscape stuff in high school and then in college I got a 4x5 camera freshman year. Um, I got a medium format camera. I got some vintage cameras that I played around with. Got my first Nikon. Took a summer job at a um, photographic, um, store that had a, a studio that people could come in and rent. Also, they had, um, a lab which developed everything from people's snapshots to, uh, high-end fine art, uh, printing. And I ran the black and white lab. Um, so my summer job, I pretty much was in the dark room the whole summer. So, uh, when I, when I graduated from college, I got a job with Hess's department stores photographing, um, fashion. Eventually I realized I was working retail and I was like, this is so silly. Why am I working retail? I shouldn't be working retail. Um, and Photoshop came out and I remember reading an article and I knew that if I didn't learn Photoshop, then that I'd be left in the dust. And um, so I looked for a job where they needed somebody to come in to whatever it was, um, you know, an advertising agency, whatever. They needed somebody to come in and, and learn Photoshop. And sure enough, there were, there, were, there were tons of places hiring and it said no experience necessary because nobody knew how to use Photoshop yet. So I got hired by a publishing company um, Rodale Press, which still produces um, Men's Health Magazine, Prevention Magazine. Those are probably the two most famous. And I was, uh, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I actually worked somewhere else right before that. Um, I worked at Turner Graphics. Again, they were looking for someone to come in to learn Photoshop. Primarily, they were advertising for a photographer because they figured a photographer would be able to learn the program easier than a um, graphic artist. So I came in. I remember the owner. It was just the owner and myself, very small um, commercial art type agency that did anything and everything in advertising. And she sat me down and she handed me the Photoshop Bible, which used to be published every year. And she said, here's the program. Here's this book. I'll be back in six hours. So she left me at the studio, uh, sitting there on, on a big, you know, big Mac for the day version one of Photoshop with this Photoshop Bible. And I bumped something on the keyboard and the toolbar disappeared. (laughs) And I'm looking through the Photoshop Bible to figure out how I, how I lost the, 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 the toolbar on the side in Photoshop. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. And finally, there was a store here locally that sold Macintosh computers called DoubleClick. This is before there was such a thing as as an Apple store. 
And I called them and I said, I'm really sorry to bother you, but I've spent two hours trying to figure this out. And I told the, the uh, salesman on the phone what I had done. And he said, he laughed and he said, you'll never do this again. He goes, just hit the tab key. And sure enough, the toolbar came back. And I'll never forget that day because I thought, boy, this program is going to be hard to learn if I can't even find the toolbar. So, um, but I learned a lot very quickly. And then from there, um, got the job, got a job with Rodale Press, um, where, again, like your experience level, um, there weren't too many people around at that point that really knew Photoshop. Um, and I mean, for the, you know, the beginning of the Photoshop era, we were in, at Turner Graphics, we started in version one, and we were in version three, I think, when I left Turner Graphics, and then at Rodale Press, I started at Rodale Press on version three or four, um, and I was there through many versions. I was there for about four years. Um, I remember we did, um, we did something for the, um, the Summer Olympics when they were in Atlanta, which would have been 96, I think. Um, and it was a radial blur. And I started the radial blur uh, before I left for the day on a Friday. And this timestamp on the radial blur uh, finishing on the image was Sunday afternoon when I came back in Monday morning. And the file was a whopping 32 megs, which back then was <laughs> huge. Um we did uh, drum scanning and also high end. We had T3 cables, which back then was like unheard of. Like we were, you know, not too many people had that. So the internet kind of came out while I was working there and they wanted us to learn the internet. So if you didn't have something to work on, um, you were on the internet figuring out how to use it. And I mean, I think for the rest of my life, that'll be kind of that, that, that in, that amazing invention that, you know, I got to experience live. Um, my, my coworkers were always playing cards on their computers when, uh, we didn't have something to edit. And I was on the internet shopping like right away. I was like, Oh, this is great. <laughs> wow. So as, as anything to do in photography, you can easily say, been there, done that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, like, I mean, I've, I've photographed everything from yeah. diamond stud earrings to giraffes, um, uh, newborns for a while, um, wasn't real happy when I, I mean, I, I became known for my newborn photography and I really didn't enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. so finally was able to say goodbye to that chapter of my photography and now my focus is all on animals, both domestic and wild, you know, people's horses, their pets, um, cats, dogs, whatever. And then the zoo animals, um, this past week on Monday, I, I photographed a sloth in a studio setup that I take up to my zoo. Um, so I was photographing a sloth one hour and then I was in an enclosure with a raccoon. I was in the penguin enclosure photographing the penguins. Um, they were picking at my shoelaces, trying to untie my shoes. Um, really crazy day. And it's, it's amazing to think that, you know, that all came from wanting to do print competition, which, you know, you don't know when you enter print competition, this journey it's going to take you on. And there's people that say to me all the time, oh, how's that helped your business? Why, you know, you spend so much time on print competition. I'm like, it's made my business. It's made who I am. It's made me be here today talking to you. Um, it's made me a better artist. And I mean, when you enter a competition and um, even if you don't enter and you just pay the little fee, the tiny quarterly fee to printcompetition.com just so you can watch the the competition live and see the scores and go into the archive and rewatch video of scoring and judging. It's the cheapest education that there is out there. And it's, 
you know, definitely a very specific style of image. When you look at a PPA um, merited image, they have a very unique uh, signature to them. And so I've tried to learn how to step away from that when I enter other competitions around the world because there are definitely other competitions out there that don't fall into that mold. Um, but you can't stream and watch any of them, which I wish you could. So I think learning, learning on printcomp.com is a great way to start a journey if you want to become a better artist. Um, and it'll make you a better portrait photographer or a better, uh, you know, real estate photographer or, or a better food photographer um, because all those little elements that they nitpick about in an image for competition generally just make any image better. True. And talking of image and image competitions, um, this image, we will miss you. It got, um, uh, it scored a platinum in, in um Masters Photography International, and um, I, you mentioned that there was a story behind this. I am so keen to find out what was your inspiration, what was the story behind this image before we get into it. So I was traveling to a zoo about five hours from my house to actually photograph an elephant for a client. Um, I was traveling to the Pittsburgh Zoo um, which is on the border of Pennsylvania and Ohio. And of course, while I was there, I was walking around the zoo photographing other things. And so I came upon the giraffes. So this image here um, on my screen mm -hmm. is, is, is an image I saw happening while I was at the zoo. And I thought, oh, that's really sweet. I love the way... You know, she's kind of nuzzling him and having a moment. And I stood there and I was at a point in my my competing um, journey that I knew I could do something with this for competition. And so I was just kind of waiting. I, I waited, uh, you know, I just stood there with my camera and waited for him to turn his head. And mm -hmm. so he turned his head. And of course, the moment was gone with her, but I got his head turned so that I could potentially um, have them both kind of looking in the same direction. Mm -hmm. I didn't know quite yet what I was going to do with them, but I knew there was definitely a really cool image in the future um, of those two giraffes. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. in Binghamton, New York, a little giraffe named uh, Tajiri that people know about from April the Giraffe. Um, he was born on, on the internet live, like everybody watched him be born. Um, they had like over, I think, two million people watching him be born. Um, he was slated to leave Binghamton and go to another facility because male giraffes can't live with their fathers. They can live with other males that they're not related to, but they can't actually live with their their fathers. Um, they'll pretty much kill each other. Um, so uh, he was going to leave. And so I thought, well, maybe I could tell that story about how the male giraffe, the baby male giraffes have to leave home. So I was like, okay, so they're saying goodbye to the giraffe. So how could a giraffe travel, you know, to leave home? And I mean, they're pretty tall. So, you know, we have to address that issue. I tried putting, I tried putting him in a taxi cab. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> um, but I came up with the idea of the train. And so mm -hmm. I had, what I did is I searched my, my various images that I have. So I had this image of Tajiri. I had this beautiful sky that I had photographed then I needed a little train car. So this I had to get as a stock image. This is from Deposit Photos, this little train car uh, to put Tajiri in. And then I needed, um, I needed, you know, another set of train tracks that I thought I might need to use. And then I needed a train station. And the big thing with the train station is it had to be a train station that had height that the giraffes would fit under because... A full-grown male giraffe can be 25 feet tall. 
So as I was searching for train stations, many of them had a very low overhang, like only like 15 feet, 16, 17 feet tall. But when I saw this one, I thought, you know what, this is going to work because the way this was photographed, it has the appearance or the illusion of being much taller than it is. It's definitely, I think it's at least 20 feet, but I thought I could make this work. So what I do generally when I do this kind of work is I do a mock-up before I buy the stock images because it can get really expensive. Mm -hmm. So this is my really bad like cut and paste, you know, like cut out, you know, like when you used to cut out stuff in magazines as a kid, yeah. my little cut and paste exercise um, to see if this is going to work. And I, I set this up and I thought, oh boy, this is going to take a long time to make this image. And this, this image of Tajiri here wasn't the one I ended up using because I realized he had to be facing more front, but I, I wanted to see if I could make this all come together. So I ended up buying this eye stock image and the deposit photos images I got and, um, and started the process of putting this whole thing together. So what I'm going to do is open a couple uh, steps along the way to kind of show you how this progressed and this image did take me over 200 hours wow yes it was a very very long painful process uh to finish this image but it was well worth it in the end it's probably one of my favorites of all time that i've created so let me grab Let's grab this one first. All right, so this is version two. So I've started to put my pieces together and and incorporate, um, we've got our, now you'll see that I flipped the train station based mm -hmm. on the fact that the giraffes were facing um, camera left. I try to not flip animals. Like I'd rather flip architecture than the animals whenever possible. Um, I got my little my little um, caboose car here. And uh, one of the first things I had to do when I when I did this, because since I flipped the train station, I had to redo the clock because now the clock was wrong. I built my giraffes. By piecing together, there's the new head. I had to put Tajiri on the car. So now we have a forward facing Tajiri. Mm -hmm. I, I made my new clock and I brought it a little bit, a little bit more forward. Um, and I changed the time. Um, the original time was like, I don't even know what time that is because it's backward. I guess it's five after three or something. Um, I wanted it to be like an evening, uh, going off into the sunset. So I wanted to make sure that the time on the clock made sense for that time of day. Cause a judge would have caught that and they would have said, well, based on the lighting, that time of day, look at the clock, you know, the clock is wrong. You know, I remade the clock, um, started piecing this together. Um, one of the things I, I had to do was recreate the hoofs down here because some of them were behind rocks in the original image. So I had to get hoofs and recreate them from other uh, images that I had and kind of build this in. You'll also notice that the train station had a wooden floor. Mm -hmm. And so my early journey with this image, I had the wooden floor kind of blending into the rocks. And I was hoping I could get away with that. But needless to say, I could not. So that was like version two. If we go to version three, usually in the couple first beginning versions, a lot happens to one of my images. And I save everything um, down the road so I can go back and do these kind of programs. So now we have a little bit farther along. We have our sky. We have this other um, little bit of landscape that I added. It's coming through the trees over here, so I had to piece it together. You know, we have this train track coming forward. The building itself is creating a nice leading line coming in from the right. 
we have train track leading lines from the left and there's a tiny little leading line up here in the clouds and another one at the roof line of the train station and I find that it's really important to be aware of your leading lines when you're creating these things because it really will help sell the story. You'll see too that the giraffes are the wrong color because of the lighting that they were in when they were photographed. I don't worry about it at this stage yet. Uh, depending on the direction I go with a composite, I, I sometimes don't change everything until I get closer to the end. Mm -hmm. But, you know, painstakingly, these were silhouetted out. And, and like I said, you can see where I added, I added the new head. The good thing is, even though his body position had moved when he turned his head, because giraffes can twist their necks so much, it works. You know, he could be in this position with his body still slightly going to the left. Um, so I was really lucky. There's some animals that it wouldn't have looked right because they can't do that. The other thing I always try to keep in mind too, so when, um, when you're making one of these stories, ideally if you have your background first, and then you go out and photograph the animal you want to put in it, it's a lot easier because when you find the background, whether you've shot it or not, but you find your whole background story and you know what lens was used to photograph it, whether it's wide angle or telephoto, then you can photograph the animals with the same lens, the same angles and everything. When you do it backwards, like I did for this one, it's a lot harder because you're now working with different lens lengths, different times of day, even different ISOs. So mm -hmm. just a little tip is if you can, if you can actually create the background first and then add the uh, animals, it's a lot easier. So here we are with a little bit more progress. We've got Tajiri in his little caboose car. A side note, um, when this was in competition, one of the judges argued that it was dark in there, that you would see stuff inside that caboose. And I beg to differ. Um, you mm -hmm. wouldn't, you wouldn't see anything inside that caboose. The light is coming from the left. Um, there's no light source in here. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I thought that, and that's the kind of stuff sometimes you'll hear and you can't assume they're right all the time because sometimes they're not. So just food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have here we have this kind of um along the progression there's all kind of, you'll see that i've started to clean up some of the decaying paint there's still this there was also if you look back there was an air conditioning unit um there was all kinds of uh, wires coming down these are all the kind of things that you know i start to remove and make decisions on um, as I'm editing these things and now I still have these weird blue things, you know, and there's like this thing coming down here So, you know, all these things start to disappear um, Over time. This was given a painterly effect in the background in Topaz When I have an involved background, I usually like to use impression in Topaz, which now is is kind of a standalone it's still available um it's a little hard to find on their website but you can still use it if you want to and then i'll hand paint um the images that i have in the foreground to kind of mimic the same style of painting you'll also notice that i've started to add some color here to them to bring them into the right uh color color key to match the time of day the sun is like hitting the tops here, which is, you know, really warm and inviting. I kept some of the cooler tones in the back. I added a shadow, um, again, to dictate the time of day. Had to add a shadow on the clock as well. And then here you'll see that I just added some shadowing down on the feet to ground them better so that they don't look so floaty. You'll hear a judge mm -hmm. say, oh, it looks like it's floating. Here I added shadows on the train track. I also took away this bright square up here in the ceiling, which it would be a distracting element. Then I actually made it even darker. Then I got rid of those strange little blue things 
um, that were hanging down and I really pulled down the highlights in the front here, got rid of this. There was something here, some sort of light, um, some kind of maybe an emergency light or something. This layer might just be a duplicate. Let me see here. Here I added some shadowing with history brush on the side of the caboose. Uh, again, kind of pulling in the time of day and the directional lighting. And you'll see that there's now stone where there was hardwood. Now here's the funny thing. I was looking at this for hours and hours and hours and that hardwood wasn't bothering me. And I screenshot this with the hardwood. I texted it to a friend who's not even a photographer. And I said, what do you think of this? She goes, why is the hardwood blending into the rocks? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> And I'm like, so you don't have to ask a photographer for feedback. You could ask yeah. just a random friend of yours who knows nothing about art and they will find something wrong with your image. And she did. So I went back, I was on version nine or 10. I don't remember. And uh, I know this says version seven, but I renumbered them um, for this thing. But I went back and uh, I had to go back like so many versions to find what I could use to make the stone for this part of the floor without it looking like it had been uh, cloned or repeated or, you know, whatever. And um, mm -hmm. when you get to a point where you're almost done an image and now there's like something you have to fix, I call it band-aiding. You're taking a band-aid and you're patching together your image that has never been patched before and now you're cutting it apart and you're patching it to make it better. Mm -hmm. Um, and so anyway, I had to add the rock back here. Um, so here I added a little bit of toning on this side of the image because it was looking a little off. Mm -hmm. So you can see that. Yeah. There's our smoke coming out of the train as it's pulling out of the station. Mm -hmm. Added some sunshine, which is a nice, you know, soft yellow. Added a little bit more sunshine. So I know I kind of took it away and brought it back in a way, but I brought it back with the correct color. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to close that version. There's our mock-up again to see where we came from. Sometimes I look at these mock-ups and I think, oh my God, it was so much work. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much work. Um, 200 hours. 200 hours, yeah. But this is this is the final. And I did crop in, I ended up cropping for competition. I cropped it in about here. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that my crop tool always has the Fibonacci spiral as the option. Mm -hmm. And I always make sure my subject is in the Fibonacci spiral. And I, I'm so used to this that when I photograph even humans, if I have a portrait session, if I throw this on anything straight out of camera, my my subject is in the Fibonacci spiral now. I'm just so used to doing it. And that actually started from college. That wasn't a recent thing. I mean, that was just fine art training in college. You can set up the crop tool up here with any option you want, but I like the golden spiral. I also don't agree with rotating the golden spiral in this part of the world. This is the golden spiral that we perceive because we read left to right. Mm -hmm. And the end of a story is bottom right. So, you know, if you're rotating your Fibonacci spiral to make your image fit in it, in, in my opinion, that's cheating. <laughs> so if you live in China, yes, it would be different. If you live somewhere, you know, where the, the culture is, is, is more right to left versus left to right, sure, that's fine. So when I was teaching... Um, the summer that this image was um, in competition and gone to districts or no, actually it hadn't gone to districts. It wasn't ready for districts. This went straight to IPC, which was PPA's international print competition. Um, it went straight there without getting any, um, any play ahead of time. Anyway, when I would show this image at a, an event, moms in the audience would cry because they related to this as their child going off to college or moving away from home. And so they would cry. So I felt like I did a good job of, of this story with that type of reaction, um, you mm -hmm. know, from, from a mom. 
and I'm really I'm really happy with the way it turned out. I'm glad I invested all that time in this image. So, and it was titled "We Will Miss You." Yeah. Now I noticed that you uh, take care of very very small details. Would you say that's one of your secrets to winning or being so far? far ahead of everybody else in competitions? So when they called it loan collection with PPA many years ago, they've done away with that term now. It's image ex imaging excellence instead, but they used to call it loan collection. Mm -hmm. And so I would have people contact me for feedback on their image. And I would say, well, you got to change this and you got to do this and you got to do this. And they'd be like, oh, I don't want to spend that much time on it. And I would say, well, lazy doesn't loan. And... <laughs> It's true. I mean, you have to be nitpicking these images apart because if you see it and you like, let's say you come back to your image, you walk away, you go have lunch, you come back to your image and you're like, oh, now I see something. Oh, I can't unsee it. And if I see it, the judge might see it. They might not, but why take the risk? So fix it. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I think... I think that I find a very passionate connection with animals in my art. Like I try to find these moments that are almost like the way humans interact, you know, like mm -hmm. with baby animals and their mother, um, with adults, um, with even this, you know, like she's, he's kind of letting her be comforted, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as she's gazing off watching her baby go away. I mean, technically, these aren't even the parents of this giraffe in reality. These are two different zoos. But uh, ideally, that, you know, getting the actual parents in a pose that would have worked, <laughs> I mean, would have been wonderful, but wasn't going to happen. You know, so I, I think, yes, I think that, you know, can you do an image in three hours and do really well with it? Yeah, you can. Um, I've had a couple images that were very small investments in time and they've gone far, far, you know, as far as this. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but <sighs> this is also a composite. So, I mean, you know, there's two things going on here. There's the story, there's the painting, which is one thing, and you can certainly take an image and paint it. But now on top of it, I've composited the image too. And I've worked mm -hmm. from things that were shot in all different times of day, all different types of lenses and pulled it all together um, to make it work. And like I said, my biggest, my biggest challenge with this image was I had to make that roof line believable or the first thing I would have heard was, well, there's no way a giraffe could fit under that roof. So that was my first, my first challenge with finding an image to, uh, to put in there for a train station. Tell us about, you know, you've got some amazing classes that you give um, on not only how to prepare your images for uh, print competition, but also on digital paintings and and um, how to be doing that. Tell us in a few words um, about that. Okay, so I have an education site um, where you can sign up for upcoming presentations and webinars, or you can purchase um, older ones. We have, we have backgrounds um, that I sell that are custom made backgrounds that can be utilized into these, these animal images. My program is called Metamorphosis. So whenever I do one of these editing um, programs, they all have the same name. They have Metamorphosis, but they're always different each time. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a horse one coming up in May that will be live by the end of this weekend. But this one here from December 30th, the content in this class versus the content from March 19th are, are very different. This was hosted by ASP, so it's also a fundraiser for them. I'm sharing the money with them. Half the money goes to ASP. And then there's background collections and there's mentoring if people want to mentor with me. So it's education.judyreinfordphotography.com. And you can just sign up for my mailing list if you like, um, so that you'll get notifications when there's a new class. Just contact me if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I understand you've got backgrounds there that are digital as well as physical. 
These are digital and then ACI, um, American Color Imaging is gonna be, they should be launching any day, an entire line of printed backgrounds. Nice. So you can buy them for your studio. And then um, what I always recommend is if you do buy, if you do buy um, a couple of these backgrounds for your studio to hang in your studio, buy the digital collection too, so mm -hmm. that you can overlay it um, for purposes of touch up in, mm -hmm. in the studio. So like, let's say you have a shadow because something didn't go quite right with your lighting. Um, instead of trying to clone it in Photoshop, you could have the actual digital background to lay over top of it and just fix it that way. All right. Well, thank you so much, Judy. Where, where can uh, viewers see more of your work or follow you? Are you on socials? And... Yeah, you can follow me on Facebook. You can follow Judy Reinford Photography on Facebook. I also have an education group, which is Master Artist Compositing in Photoshop Painting with Judy Reinford. If you want to join my group, you can. And that's on Facebook. Yeah, this is on Facebook. Um, there are some questions uh, in order to join the group. So if I don't know you and you don't answer the questions, I will decline you. Um, okay. So, so just answer the questions. Well, thank you so much, Judy. That was so enlightening. And it was such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Now, if you've enjoyed this session, make sure to hit the like button and also the subscribe button so that you don't miss any further interview. Thank you.